I'll start. So my name is James Powell. And you're supposed to say hi, James, here. Hi, James. Uh, we can do better than that. I mean, we're on camera, so we can make at least sound to the YouTube audience that there's a lot of people in the room. Hi, James. Hi, James. Hi, James. Very good. We're at PyData Seattle. It is Sunday, July 26, 2015. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, you can follow me at don't use this code. If you'd like to email me, you can email me at james at don't use this code com. And a long time ago, I had a blog that I'm, in, in all the presentations I've given in the last three years, I've promised to keep updating at seriously don't use this code com. Now, one of the purposes of this slide is to let you know that I'm full of bad ideas. In fact, I don't think I have anything that's not a bad idea. I think Kyle Kelly and Jake Vanderplas in the audience can attest to that. And in fact, this talk is probably a very bad idea. Before I get into why this talk is a bad idea, I just wanted to mention an organization that makes this event possible, NumFocus. I'm a volunteer with NumFocus, and I've been helping this weekend to try and put this event on. NumFocus is the 501c3 that funds projects like Julia, IPython Notebook. It provides fundings like other projects like NumPy. It is the organization that makes a lot of these tools that you use in open source data science possible. It's the organization that makes PyData possible. In fact, this year, NumFocus will be hosting over four PyDatas. The four, the four major ones are Dallas at SMU, London at Bloomberg, Seattle at Microsoft, and New York at Bank of America coming up. We've also hosted smaller PyData events uh, in Florence, in Paris, and in Berlin. So NumFocus is what makes this event possible, and you should be sure to thank Leah and the other volunteers at NumFocus as many times as you can today. They are an amazing crowd, and it's an organization that needs our support. So in general, about me, I speak about Python, I speak about software engineering, I speak about quant finance every so often, I speak about data science, I speak about machine learning, and if you like this talk or you want to get some more fieriness from me, uh, I spoke earlier this year at Pi Tennessee, I gave a lightning talk at PyCon in Montreal, I gave a talk at RStats in New York City, I was the token non-R speaker. I gave a talk at PyData 9 in Dallas. That's a thing we're doing now. We're numbering the PyDatas. I spoke at the Open Data Science Conference in Boston. I spoke at PyData 10 in London. I spoke at PyData 11 Seattle. If you'd like to find me, I'll be at Pi Gotham in New York. I'll probably be at Pi Texas. I'll be speaking at Strata in New York. I may be speaking at PyCon Canada in Toronto. And I'll probably be speaking at PyData in New York City. And I may also be speaking at ODSC in San Francisco. And I actually forgot there's one more at the end. And I, I, may, I may head out to Spain again to speak at PyCon Spain. So if you have already gotten tired of me, now that we're five minutes into my talk, don't worry. You'll have plenty of other times to avoid coming to my talks. <laughs> OK. So I wanted to give you a little bit of history of my interaction with uh, the PyData conference series. By the way, we're now numbering PyData. So at least that's the thing I'm trying to get started. So I gave my very first PyData talk at PyData number one, which is in New York City at Lighthouse International in 2012. And I talked about generators. And I thought, people love generators, so I'll talk about it again at PyData two at Silicon Valley, at, which was at the end of PyCon in 2013. And I thought, let's broaden things a little bit, because I really like CPython as well, and I like really low-level stuff. So I gave a talk about Numba, I gave a talk about embeddings of Python, I gave a talk about generators at PyData three, at Microsoft Nerd Center in Boston. And you know these topics are very interesting. So I talked again about embeddings of Python and generators of PyData 4 at, at, in New York at JP Morgan. I repeated those talks in London at level 39. I reworked one of those talks about generators because people really seem to like generators at Silicon Valley at Facebook. And I thought, you know what? We've got to get some generators up here in Europe. So I gave that talk in Berlin at the end of EuroPython, the PyData event that we held there. And then I started to, to uh, focus. I got a little tired of generators, so I wanted to give a little talk about some CPython internals and some black magic um, at PyData 8 in New York. That's the one where Apollo Creed comes back. <laughs> and earlier this year, I, I, actually, I actually started with a new talk, this talk that you're going to hear, Integration with the Vernacular. And I also gave an impromptu talk, CPython Meanderings, which was me I was, I was in the bathroom, my phone rang, and they were like, oh my goodness, the speaker's canceled. Can you come up on stage and give a talk? So that's what CPython meanderings was. And then in London, I gave this talk, Integration with the Vernacular. So what is this talk all about? This talk is about the NumPy approach. It's about trying to conceptualize 
what we're doing when we're using NumPy, or how NumPy integrates into software development practice. The purpose of this talk isn't so much to convey an opinion about whether this is good or bad, but to try to create a language around engineering modeling, about software development as a field unto itself, about software engineering where it doesn't just mean writing code. Because there is engineering to software beyond just writing code. And I would say that one of the most disappointing things about software as a field is how debased it is. It really, when we talk about ourselves as software engineers, we are nothing like actual engineers. There is nothing even approaching engineering analysis. There's no conceptualizations, there's no shared vocabulary, or there's very minimal shared vocabulary. How often do you see two professionals in another field in a conversation, and one of them says to each other, oh, Let's repeat to ourselves what we learned in the 101 version of this class. And yet it happens in software all the time. There's no expectation of some shared knowledge base or even some shared idea, right? Did Steve McConnell try to attack that? No, I, I, I haven't had an opportunity to bring this up uh, before Steve McConnell. But this is, this is my own personal opinions, non-representative of any of the other entities that I do happen to represent. The purpose of this talk is to try to introduce some language for describing and conceptualizing software and software development. And it's not to talk about NumPy as being good or bad or this approach about as being good or bad. In fact, NumPy is actually pretty darn good. There are a lot of corners, to, there's a lot of really rough corners to NumPy and in some cases, you know, there's some, still some long-standing bugs in it and there's some areas where it hasn't really been polished. But one thing, that computer scientists, I feel, don't do enough, that engineers do all the time, is they look at an imperfect world and they say, well, you know, this is good enough, we're getting some work done, we're doing some good. It's not perfect, it's not elegant, it's kind of sloppy, it doesn't work in all cases, but this is what we're working with. And in that case, NumPy is actually pretty great. I will warn you that this talk is totally inscrutable, but who cares? This is one thing that I've been, I've been thinking about a lot after giving this talk twice this year, which is, you know, who really cares about this stuff? And certainly, nobody here does, especially not data scientists. I told you that I gave a talk at RStats in New York City, and the reason that I gave that talk was that the person who was running that conference, Jared Lander, is somebody who I've invited to speak at Pi.events in the past as a token R speaker in a Python conference. And so he said, I'll return the favor, and you can be the token Python speaker in an R conference. But when I got up on stage, I realized that I was speaking in front of an audience that didn't care about anything that I was talking about. They were data scientists who don't care about software. They were R programmers who don't care about Python. And, and that's really the case. Data scientists are usually people who are so involved in the tasks that they're working on that small things like engineering considerations don't really matter to them, and nor should they. You have more pressing concerns, you have problems in front of you that you really care about, that you really want to solve, and in many cases your work is idiosyncratic. You're working to produce some output, and it's only the output that matters. The process or the procedure that you go through isn't really that important to the people who are signing your paycheck. You're not building these large engineering artifices, or in many cases you aren't, or you're not doing that yet. In fact, much of your work may just be in an IPython notebook, and the only thing that you're delivering to anybody is the results in the last cell. So a lot of these considerations around software engineering don't really matter. Although, I would say that they actually do really, really, really matter. It's just that, for the most part, you can kind of scrape by and pretend that they don't. I would say, in fact, that many of the people in the audience are actually engineers. I think it's, it's very interesting sometimes when you look at the authors behind a lot of projects in open source. And if you look at their bios, you'll see that, they're, that they describe themselves as physicists or astronomers or biologists, and yet much of what they're known for is not physics or astronomy or biology, but contributions to open source. And in fact, there is a case of a certain gentleman who is in the physics department at a very large university and is leading a very large project. And as I understand it, all the classes that he teaches are actually in computer science. And this is an interesting case. Many of, many of us who are data scientists or even scientists, a lot of our time is spent in software to the point where we really are software engineers. We're just not trained at it at all. And we don't care about it. And that's somewhat problematic. As a result, I've been looking for this talk for a long time. Not this specific talk, because I can't say that I'm looking I can say that the talk that I'm looking for is not the talk that I'm myself able to give. But I've been looking for more people to talk about these kind of things, to talk about at a very high level modeling and engineering, 
and engineering, software engineering as a process, as a dynamic development process, and all the considerations around that. I view engineering as fundamentally a human process. So it's not about the elegance of the math or the elegance of the code or any of that nonsense. It's about how do we create these artifacts, these, these physical things, these lines of code that serve some human need, that serve some human process, that actually achieve some goal. I would say if we wanted to belabor a mathematic analogy, we could say that what is it when we sit down to code? I always wonder, I, I, started, I started by thinking about this. What, what am I really doing when I'm sitting down to code? I'm not creating art. I think that's absolute nonsense because I'm being paid to do this. And that's not to say that artists aren't paid, but the purpose of doing this is not to express some inner beauty that I see in the world. The purpose of this is to achieve some concrete goal. The purpose of this is to achieve some concrete goal that is very well correlated to me getting paid so that I can have a roof over my head. And what I think that we're doing is we're serving some business need by automating some process. And in the process of automating that, we need to take an infinitely profound universe, reduce it in complexity to something that can be expressed in a computer. And the process of that is essentially the creation of an algebra. That is, we have some objects, and we have some properties, and we have some relations, we have some operations that can be performed on them, and the code is encoding those operations and encoding certain characteristics of the domain, the codomain, and we're establishing those characteristics, we're establishing those properties of the code that we write, and then we're running it and hoping that this extrapolates to the entirety of the domain, right? So if you were to define some field or some ring or some mathematical structure for me, you would say, here's the operation, here are the numbers that it operates on, but you wouldn't say, well, just to make sure this works, I'm going to test addition on 1 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 1 plus 2, and just keep going on and on. You wouldn't have this iterative enumerative approach, this enumerative approach that Dijkstra criticized so heavily. You'd say, I'm establishing these properties, and I'm saying that this is a sufficiently well-defined algebra such that those properties extend to all of the inputs that I'll get, providing me outputs that I can expect. And that's what software really is. But let's not belabor mathematical analogies. Instead, let's belabor social science analogies. So the title of this talk is based on some research that I did in my undergraduate on sociopolitical movements and language in modern China. And in the early 20th century in China, there was the May 4th movement. It was started on the 4th of May in 1919 in Beijing. It was in part a student movement and also a movement of intellectuals. And very closely associated with this movement were many authors. And these authors are considered to be the eminent authors of pre-contemporary Chinese literature. Uh, they are the Joseph Conrads or the, the Bokovs of Chinese literature. Um, their names Lu Xun, Mao Dun, and Lao Se. And they are, tip one thing that typifies what th their, their literary style was the use of written vernacular Chinese. This is something that may seem a little bit odd to many of the English speakers in the audience, but prior to the May 4th movement, much of, or actually all of written Chinese was not written in the vernacular. What you would write in a book was not what people actually spoke. And it was not even close to the language that people actually spoke. It was a classical language. It was a language that had existed for hundreds of years prior to this point. And one thing that typified, one of the very provocative things that these authors did was they wrote books in the language that people actually spoke. One thing that typifies this older style of writing, this classical Chinese, is the existence of idiomatic expressions. And idiomatic expressions exist through to even modern Chinese. One example of them is falling leaves return to their roots. And if you were to figure out what this phrase means, if you look up in your dictionary, you wouldn't see a single definition. You may see a reference to some classical text. And in this case, the classical text is the records of the transmission of the lamp. And you'd see that this comes from some phrase, some dialogue between two, two characters in that text. And its meaning is not to be taken sola scriptura. Its meaning is the result of some classical interpretation and hundreds of years of people interpreting and studying this text. In fact, this particular phrase that is very, very common in vernacular Chinese is, originates from this document that's from the Song Dynasty, which was many, many, many years ago. And you can kind of look up the, the dialogue that it comes from. And if you look through this, you may find that 
the phrasing that you expect shows up right here. And this is something that we're somewhat familiar with in English. We have some of these callbacks in English. We have them in the names of titles. Shakespeare is a very good example. We have many titles of many works that call back to Shakespeare. And these callbacks are not always, these allusions are not always obvious to us. North by Northwest is one example. What Dreams May Come is one example. Murder Most Foul is another. Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country is another example. The Wrath of Khan, unfortunately, is not from Shakespeare. We also have a lot of phrases that we borrow from, it, from Shakespeare as well, that people don't even realize come from Shakespeare, that didn't exist prior to, to his introduction. Foregone conclusion is from Othello. Sea change is from The Tempest. To send somebody packing is from Henry VI. But this is very different in Chinese, in that even in this example of this one phrase, you can see that while this phrase has been adapted, so if you look at the first set, this is the modern phrasing of it. In, in modern Chinese, you'd say luo ye guigen, but the actual historical phrasing of this is ye lo guigen, and they actually swap the first two characters in order to make it a little bit more palatable to a modern ear. However, this is not just like something, this is not just some phrase that existed in an old book. This is a phrase that integrates very poorly into the modern vernacular Chinese. Because, for example, if you had a, fr a, a, a sentence like, this propo proposal is not guaranteed to go through, which you translate into Chinese as this, and note that Chinese is an isolating language. It has no inflectional morphology, meaning we can actually break it down into word by word. We'll see that on this line here, guaranteed, is expressed by this four-character proverb, li suo dang ran. But the thing is, if you speak Chinese and you read this, that phrase pops out to you. It's being used in some adverbial sense, but it's very obvious that it's not well integrated into the language, into the vernacular language. It just exists as this concrete, indivisible unit. And here's some reference for where it comes from. Very, very rarely does one actually look up the references for where these phrases come from, but you can always look them up and see where they come from. And in this particular case, it doesn't actually exist in the modern form at all. So this is something that, I know it's a belabored analogy, but this is something that, um, that really struck me the more I got into programming with NumPy. That is, I always felt that NumPy really poorly integrates into the vernacular of modern Python. That is, every time NumPy shows up in my code, I can see that this is NumPy code. I can see this is not idiomatic Python code. This is based on some incantations or based on some structures that existed prior to the contemporary Python vernacular. And it's something that just sticks out like a store thumb, just in the same way that these four character proverbs stick out as a store thumb to a native Chinese speaker when they exist in the vernacular. But let's briefly go over what NumPy is. I don't think the audience needs it that much, but it's a library for scientific computing and numeric computing. It's the basis of tools of like SciPy and Pandas and Scikit-Learn. We might look at NumPy and say that it's a collection of algorithms, things like matrix operations, but that's not really what it is. And we might say it's a collection of things like FFT and constants and operations like that, but that's not really what it is. I think NumPy really is just the ND array, the multidimensional array, and operations that are performed around it. So in NumPy, you can create an array that looks like this, and you can do things like broadcast multipl the multiplications across the entire array, and you can do things like fancy indexing, and you can do things, you can look at the NumPy array and when you actually look very closely at this ND array, you immediately see something that is very unpythonic. Yesterday, Steve Gower gave a fantastic talk about what's new in Python 3.5. And one of the things that was added to Python 3.5 was the math module now has a function called isClose that allows you to determine if two numbers are close enough by some relative or some absolute metric, some threshold. And I asked Steve, well, can you see if two numbers are adjacent? In a language like Julia, it's very easy to see if two numbers are adjacent. That is, if their integer representations are right next to each other. That is, if they differ by at most one ulp. But this is not something that you do in Python. This is something that's foreign to Python, because Python doesn't deal with floating point numbers in terms of machine types. In fact, Python tries as hard as it can to get away from a notion of floating point numbers as machine types. We don't care if it's a float 32 or a float 64. It's just some floating point number. And an indication of this is, for example, in Python 3, 
this, the, 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 the behavior of truncating division as a default when you divide two integers has been eliminated. It's thought that if you do three divided by two, it doesn't make sense to give one. It doesn't make sense to give a non-floating point result to truncate the point five at the end of that because we're trying to build a, number, a numeric system for humans, not one that requires knowledge of the machine. But NumPy immediately brings this back to your attention. Because a D type on a NumPy and D array is always a machine type. And it's always defined in terms of the machine type. And it's something that already, at the most basic sense of just creating a NumPy and D array with a couple of numbers in it, does not integrate into normal Python. Because you can take a NumPy and D array and stick really big ints into it and add one to it. And immediately, the behavior is completely different than if you had a list and you added one to each element. Because there'll be machine types. They'll overflow. They'll wrap around. You'll have all of the behaviors that you expect from, for example, limited 64-bit floating point or two's complement integers that you don't see in actual idiomatic Python. But let's, let's think a little bit higher of what NumPy is and why NumPy works in this way and why NumPy is useful or how it's actually integrated into code. And, and when I think about NumPy, I think of it as being a very useful tool for providing a restricted, constrained computation environment. What you can think is that pure Python has as minimal a connection to things like machine types as they can get away with. Because they don't want programmers to have to think about that stuff. They want programmers to have to, to think at a much higher level in terms of the symbols they're manipulating, in terms of more humane structures like humane number systems. And they don't want you to have to think about this is a float 32 versus a float 64. This is an int 32 versus an int 64. This is an unsigned int versus, an, versus a signed int. They don't want you to have to worry about those characteristics that are more for the benefit of the machine than for the human. However, one of the reasons that we write code for the benefit of the machine is that this is for implicitly the benefit of the human in terms of performance. Namely, Nobody really wants to write Fortran. And we still do write Fortran. We still do demean ourselves by writing to, but, 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 but in, in this fashion, because we want the performance that subjugating ourselves to the machine gives us. And NumPy provides this to us in Python by, by giving this constrained computation environment. That is, you have a domain in which all of the computations are performed on machine types. The comp and certain, certain assumptions can be made in that com computation environment. There are barriers between that computation environment and the rest of your code. It's almost like an embedded DSL in Python. And that's how we get some performance back out. NumPy forces us to make certain assumptions about the types and the operations. That is, in pure Python, if you add two things together, all that's going to happen is you call pi number multiply. And what actual code runs after that pi number multiply is completely and totally arbitrary. An example of that is in Python 3 pathlib, if you add a slash to pathlib, it means path concatenation. And so you have an addition operator that's no longer commutative. You have all of these algebraic properties that are being broken just because the plus can mean whatever you want it to mean. Whereas in NumPy, you know the types that you're performing on, and you know exactly what those operations are. And you know them to the level of what the machine will know. For example, if you have an ND array full of floats and you add, it's going to call your equivalent for whatever machine you have that you're, it's going to call the assembly instruction at some point that corresponds to the addition of floating point numbers. There are other constraints that are enforced upon you when you deal with a NumPy ND array. And one of the big ones is the independence of of entities. If you have a list of Python elements, there are no constraints over what computations can be hidden behind a numeric operation. So if you, were to, if you had a list of Python objects and you were to add two of them, there's no reason why that addition couldn't subtly, through some global namespace, affect some of the other elements in the list. Because these are, pure, these are rich Python objects and there's any computation can be, can be put behind your underscore add. Whereas in NumPy, because you're restricting yourself to these very, very constrained numeric operations, you can do something like parallel broadcast an operation to an array because you know there's an independence of those entities. So let me show you kind of a, a brief example of this NumPy approach. And this NumPy approach ends up being uh, very much a building blocks approach. So one example is if you wanted to take a volume weighted average price in finance, you'd construct it by taking this building block of an average and a building block of these NumPy ND arrays and you call the average function with a keyword argument called weights and you'd be there. If you wanted to do something like an exponential moving average, you do the exact same thing with NumPy. You take this building block that represents a convolution 
you'd pass it the kernel and you'd build the kernel with a building block that represents an exponential series and you'd divide it by the sum and you'd do the convolution, you'd have an exponential moving average. And this is often what the NumPy approach looks like. You have these very large building blocks that you're hooking together, but at some point you have a domain transformation. Now, before we get into where NumPy poorly integrates into the vernacular of Python, let's discuss two other approaches, two other modeling approaches, two other conceptualizations of how code can be structured. One of them is your so-called integrated environment, your graph computing environment. So at some point, all of you are going to see some, some piece of code where instead of constraining the computations to one area of the code, where you get all of your numbers up front and there's a bunch of matrix operations, and at the end of the matrix operations, all of those results leak out into the rest of the system that does some data feeds or mechanics or actually feeds it to whatever control system is being manipulated. You have all of these smeared together in some integration computer, in some integrated environment. And one view of these are your graph computing environment. So you'll see some code that looks like this and it may have a decorator that tags some method on some object as being a node in a graph computation. So in, in this case, as a financial example, you have a portfolio and the value of the portfolio is the sum of the individual values of the positions of the portfolio. And for the position, its value is its size times its price. And if that happens to be a bond, its price happens to be its dirty price and its dirty price happens to be its clean price plus the accrual. If it's an amortizing bond, it might have some additional behavior on top of that. If it's a CDS, it's the present value of the cash flows and so on. And this will build a graph and you can do some neat things with that graph, like you can do perturbative risk where you change some of the nodes and you do the minimal set of computations necessary in order to revalue the entire portfolio. But what, what distinguishes this approach from the NumPy approach is that you have these computations, these valuation computations, and they are smeared in your code base and intermingled with things which are not related to computations at all. Because every time you see a computing environment like this, with a price and a dirty price, these two computation fields on them, you're almost inevitably going to see some additional fields like registration type or inf indicative information about the bond. And registration type and indicative information have absolutely no relation to the pricing of this, or at least no direct relation. They're not direct inputs into the pricing model. What they are are regulatory or legal entities that are added on to these rich objects. I had a conversation, a very nice conversation last week where a programmer who was trying to build a game using Pygame was asking about NumPy. And one interesting thing about the Pygame approach or all of these game programming libraries is that they always construct the code in the same fashion. They have individual game objects, sprites that correlate to Python objects. They have computations provided on top of these objects. The individual objects can do things like rotations or transformations, but you have individual Python objects corresponding to individual semantic objects in the game. So you'll have an object for you know, a weapon, you'll have an object for a, a, a monster, and you'll have the conceptual objects that you have in the model of what you're trying to express have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the actual Python objects you're dealing with. You're not aggregating them all up into NumPy and D-Array and doing matrix transformations on them. And this allows you to do a lot of neat things like, you know, it might be nice if you have a monster, you could do monster.lefthandweapon.damage and have these nice long attribute lookup chains. But it, it eliminates your ability to do a lot of very efficient aggregate computations. And what ends up happening in many cases is you dispatch these aggregate computations to some other library, like in this particular case, PyChipmunk, and some physics library. And what that does is you register each of these individual objects. And then behind the scenes, these get aggregated into some larger, more efficient representation in order to do aggregate computations. But nobody writes games with this NumPy approach. Nobody writes games where the game objects themselves, where the billiards on a billiards table are just rows in a matrix, even though it might be a very efficient way to perform aggregate computations across every entity. They always write it as each individual billiard ball as an individual Python object, and it's a very different way of structuring that code. So let me show you why NumPy doesn't really integrate into the way that, we're written, that we write Python conflicts with idiomatic Python usage, even in the most basic cases. So if we go into our canonical resource for what's considered idiomatic Python, PEP8, we see this, we see, we see this exhortation, that if we want to determine if a sequence has any en entities, we say if not sequence or if sequence, as opposed to if len sequence or if not sequence. And we're told this is bad style and this is good style. 
And this is, works perfectly fine with Python. If you have a list of entities and you do if that list, it'll tell you if it's empty or not. And the moment you try this, or the moment you write some function that takes this and you accidentally pass a NumPy and array it, you get this, what is, what is what is often considered to be a totally inscrutable error message about the truth value of an array being ambiguous. Please use any or all. And you'd think, if you want to write a function that performs some basic operation on all the elements of some iterable, and you were to say, well, Python allows me to talk about iterables in a higher sense. It allows me to talk about iterables not in the concrete sense of lists and tuples, but in the abstract sense of anything being iterated over. And an NumPy ND array can be iterated over, therefore it's also an iterable. So I should be able to write a function that takes both NumPy ND arrays and lists. Then the only way to write this so it'll work with both is to write it in what is explicitly a non-idiomatic Python style. This is a very small and very trivial example, but you can see immediately the use of the NumPy ND array does not integrate with the use of these pure Python structures. You also see in many cases NumPy predates w much of what we consider to be contemporary Python. I feel like an archaeologist here, but, or a sociologist here, but it, it predates much of what we consider to be idiomatic contemporary Python, like generators. So here's an example of a generator, and it's just a simple generator that constructs a Fibonacci sequence. And if you try and stick it in a NumPy ND array, you end up with this. It ends up creating a NumPy ND array with one element that happens to be the generator object. And why it does that, you can make an argument for why that's a reasonable thing to do or an unreasonable thing to do. And I won't argue that it's reasonable or unreasonable, but I will say that it's often a surprising result. And it's an indication of where somebody, a well-meaning individual, might apply what they consider to be idiomatic contemporary Python usage, creating generators instead of, instead of materializing or instead of performing eager computations on materialized lists they would create a generator to perform that computation, and they'll try to put that into a NumPy ND array, and they'll realize they need to stick a list materializer right in between there to actually make it work. And, and it's a little bit of friction that's added into the process as a consequence of this, this break, this, this impotence mismatch between these two domains. And if you actually look at it, you can see if you would actually want to put this generator, now bear in mind this generator is an infinite sequence, but say we sliced it and we got out some values, or say it was a generator that produced a finite sequence, if we wanted to stick that into an NumPy ND array, the structure of the code would be the array on the outside, then a list value constructor, then the generator. And that list value constructor is a shim, right? It's a shim that's matching up the impotence on both sides of these domains. It's a domain transformation. It's transforming from the Python domain into this NumPy and domain. You can see that the NumPy style does not integrate well with rich Python objects, with a style that we enjoy using in, in, in tools like NetworkX. So NetworkX, as we all know, is a library for representing networks. And we can do some neat things with NetworkX. We can add weights to the edges. We can do nice things with the, with the weighted edges, like use these weights or these arbitrary attributes in order to implement all sorts of pathfinding algorithms. But NumPy does not allow us to easily do that. In fact, at the, very, at the most basic, NumPy does not allow us to perform customized sorts. So in Python, we have this sorted built in. And it allows us to sort a list of numbers. And if we wanted to sort these numbers by their, abs by their magnitude, by their absolute value, we just pass a key function. And it, the key function would be mapped to every element of that iterable. And it would sort it by that. So you can see these numbers are sorted not by their, but by their absolute value, not by their actual value. How do we do this in NumPy? Well, we don't have a, a, a key function that we can provide. We have no way to take that additional behavior and inject that into NumPy. So what we'll do is what back in the day we used to call a, a decorate sort on decorate or a Schwartzian transform. We'll take the NumPy ND array and instead of sorting it, we'll first transform it into another domain by doing an absolute value broadcast computation. Then we'll perform the sorting in that domain. We'll do the arg sort. And then we'll pull the elements back into We'll actually pull the elements, we'll, or rather, we'll pull the elements back into the unsorted domain. So you can see we have this Schwarzian transform here, where we have to decorate the initial values, sort them on that decorated values, and then undecorate them. And we have this domain transformation necessary because there's this impotence mismatch between the computations that are occurring in the Python domain and the NumPy domain. And you can see this is kind of split out. You can see the, the domain transformation here, the sorting within domain, and then the transformation there. 
there are also a lot of things that we can do very conveniently in NumPy, but there's limits to these conveniences. So we can easily represent multidimensional arrays in NumPy. And we can do some nice things with those multidimensional arrays, like we get the 0-0th element using this older syntax. We can get the 0-0th element using a comma syntax as though we're a matrix. We can actually even get all the elements with a specific row or a specific column. We can do nice slicings of, of this data. But the moment we try to integrate pure Python objects into it, like a dictionary, the semantics fall apart. Because if we have a NumPy ND array, where the elements of that NumPy ND array are dictionaries, how do we actually get into that dictionary? There's no mechanism to do it. If we were to do 0, 1, we might get the 0, 1 value, just like, just like it works for the uh, two-dimensional array. But if we were to do 0, 0, it doesn't make any sense, right? This particular operation, this particular indexing operation, only makes sense within the construct of NumPy. You can't say, get the 0th element, and then that second, that second dimension is actually some custom structure that implements some custom get item, and that's what gets passed to that. There's no mechanism for, making, for performing that integration. So the moment that you try to put pure Python objects into an NumPy ND array, you suddenly face this barrier where any communication with that pure Python object is much less convenient than if it were just your machine type, than if it's just an integer or a float. One example of this, and one example of the very bad idea for integrating <laughs> pure Python object in NumPy is something that I came across fairly recently. And in order to demonstrate it, well, it's, it started with uh, an overall dissatisfaction with the way that people talk about profiling in Python. I don't like when people talk about performance profiling, efficiency, because I think most benchmarks are full of hooey. I think that most benchmarks are, I went to, I went to a conference that was full of statisticians, and there were benchmarks on every slide throughout that conference about this being faster, that being faster. And there were statisticians, and there was not a single mention of whether these numbers were the mean or the median, what the variance was, what the, what the bars were, what the model was. It's nonsense. The, the, the numbers were just complete nonsense. Of course, if you were to show something to be 40 times faster, that maybe has some significance. But for a 2% difference in speed, you need a statistical model to really say is that significant or not. Anyway, when it comes to memory profiling, People always ask, well, how much memory does my Python program use? I'm going to write some complex little built-in tool that uses getSizer from the sys module and it iterates through things. It doesn't, doesn't double count things. So it has a set here or a set there. And it's usually absolute nonsense because actually analyzing how much memory a Python process uses, it's much harder than that. If you look inside CPython, you'll see that there are many cases where the garbage collector is not used, where instead for very commonly allocated objects like methods, there's free lists. And those free lists only grow. So the actual total amount of memory that your program is using at any one time may not really be as meaningful as you think, and it may not shrink with time. It may be monotonically non-decreasing. So what I thought was, let's try and get a more concrete metric. And that concrete metric is, does my application or does my program fail or not? So I wrote this very, very simple, really rinky-dink bash script. And what it does is it runs some arbitrary command line with increasing U limits of virtual memory until it stops failing. And with this I can tell, I can give it a Python script and I can say, what's the minimum amount of virtual memory that you need in order to run to completion? And then I can try something else and I can see if that minimum is higher or lower. And I can see how does this affect memory pressure? And there's a lot of small tests you can do. Well, this came into use very recently when I was investigating a limitation of the integration of pure Python objects into NumPy, which is, oh, one interesting result, uh, the single command line python-c from NumPy import array requires 84 megabytes of virtual memory in order to run without falling over. Now, there's still quite a bit of stuff that you can do with that. That doesn't mean that you need to allocate additional memory in order to do any other computation. But this is the high watermark. And anything lower than that on this system with this installation is not enough. But you can see the approach that's being taken here. We'd have some program we could see is it falling over or not. And this is a much more concrete analysis, even though it's a very rough analysis. Well, what I did was I took a simple script. And in that simple script, I took two NumPy ND arrays. And I created a circular reference between the two of them. And I stuck a Python object into one of them. And then I stuck that into a loop. And I wanted to see what would happen with garbage collection. And what happened with garbage collection is NumPy ND arrays, when there's circular references, will not clean up any Python objects within them, there's a memory leak. 
And so when I ran this, it fell over after I found the minimum amount of memory to run this loop once, then I tried to run this loop as many times as possible, garbage collecting after every iteration of the loop, and it fell down immediately after the first loop. And this is, I think, a very clear indication of, a very clear and very tangible indication of an issue with memory allocation. And if we were to perform the exact same thing with, sorry, if we were to perform the exact, this with uh, the NumPy and DRA, you'd see memory error. And if we were to perform it with pure Python lists, it runs forever. Because the Python lists, when you have circular references and they get garbage collected, everything is cleaned up because pure Python lists implement part of the Python object model called TP Traverse, which is, so the del is not called when you garbage collect something, TP Traverse is called. And TP Traverse goes through and clears all of the references that the two elements on either side of the circular reference are holding onto. NumPy and DRAs do not call that, or do not even implement it. And so as a consequence, there's a memory leak. And you can see very immediately a very poor integration, a very poor interaction between the pure Python style, where you'd expect to be able to put pure Python objects anywhere, and the NumPy style. So that is integration with the vernacular, the NumPy approach, plus a little bit of pre-talk ranting. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I, really, I really enjoyed this event so far today, and I'm really glad that all of you were able to make it to my talk. Thank you so much. No questions or comments? Please. You went over this, but I, I don't know what a generator is. So a generator is a structure in Python that was introduced, I'd say, five, over five years ago. And the idea is sometimes you have a desire to maybe model a computation as a stream where you have some data coming in and some data coming out, where the results are being generated not, you don't do, you don't do the entire computation at once. You do the computation on demand. So for example, if you can think, um, in the canonical example there, I wanted to represent an infinite sequence, but clearly I, have no, I can't hold that infinite sequence of memory. But I can have the infinite sequence modeled in a couple of lines of code, and then I can pull numbers out of it on demand. And that's typically where generator is used. There's also a lot of usages or repurposing of this for async. So do you see this as like a problem that eventually needs to be fixed, like a, oh, make a new version of NumPy that's now works with Python or whatever, or, or it's just... How, 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 how well does anyone here think Pandas really integrates into pure Python? It doesn't, right? It's very, it's very, cl it's really right, nice and really convenient to use in an IPython notebook, but it's actually very clunky to use in an actual application. And almost certainly, at some point, there will be different approaches that are taken. I can't say that NumPy is something that we should throw away. It's a very useful tool. Um, Peter Wang had a very nice comment when he sat in on this talk in Dallas where he suggested that Numba was Continuum's approach for rewriting a lot of what they were getting done using NumPy in a much more Pythonic fashion. So <clears throat> I'm on a different perspective for the bitwise operations. Okay. I, I tend to want to be very explicit for NumPy arrays uh -huh. if I'm doing bitwise ops between several arrays. Okay. Uh, so the any all stuff, uh -huh. like it, it makes sense to me because I'm going to treat them that way. Like I'm going to have collections of them. But you're now, treating, you're now treating the NumPy ND array as yeah, I, a, I think it's actually like a a opaque object, right? Yeah, so I, I feel like Python is portraying its explicit is better than implicit. There are arguments that can be made, but one of the assumptions in how we use pure Python structures is we assume some transparency. We assume these to be first class. So we don't necessarily consider there to be a barrier between the object and the collection around the object. So in the case of the if statement, you can see there's not really a barrier there. With the NumPy and D array, the, 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 the way that it's constructed creates this barrier between that. You have to end up dealing with it as though it's just some opaque object where it's not where you don't have syntax reaching into that object and performing operations the same way they do for the list. Whether that's idiomatic or not or whether that's a good idea or not, I don't know that I can comment on. Anyway, thank you so much.